So, basically the title here is An Amazing Range of Opportunities for Web Services, Grids, Cloud, Crowdsourcing, and the Internet of Things. Just about everything that's out there that's really kind of fun. But it's also something that's really interesting in the way that we can do some amazing things with all of this data. We can gain some amazing insights. Um, so there's lots and lots of places that, or things that do things, the web services, ways where you can do it in terms of the physical location, the types of compute resources, the grids and the clouds, and sort of where you can get data from, from the point of view of crowdsourcing, uh, and the Internet of Things. And then next week, we'll have the IBM with us, and then the week after that, uh, Dennis will be looking at things like sort of social networks and sort of all the social media side of the, the source of data. So, astonishing range of sources now. Open source, you can find data anywhere around in the Internet just about. You can find absolutely staggering range of information that you can bring together and you can analyze with all of these amazing types of software, whether from SAS, from IBM, loads of uh, open source analytic software. And yeah, you just suck it down. You, you're going to have to clean up your data a bit, maybe quite a lot, because we know that from the um, 14 Vs of big data that we've now got that there are a lot of questions that we have to ask ourselves about the data <coughs> before we can actually start using it. <coughs> but it also the processing can be done in an amazing range of different places and different sort of ways. We can do it on our own infrastructure, our own private servers. We can do it out in the cloud. We can do it in a public cloud, so Amazon, uh, EC3, AWS, and so on, Google, all many, many organizations provide all these cloud-based resources. And we need to think about, as we develop our work in terms of analytics, that what sort of data and where are we going to do it? Now, when we get IBM access to the IBM stuff, uh, and I'll be sorting that out uh, during the week, uh, this next tomorrow, probably, and I will email each of you uh, over the next two or three days with a link, an ID, and, and a starter password, probably. I'm not quite sure what the details are yet, but I'll be in individually inviting each of you to join into the IBM academic environment. And so if you could possibly respond with, or do whatever's on the, the email says you need to do, get your connections sorted out so that by, on Wednesday next week, <coughs> when Ross is here, then you're able to get online into their environment um, and work with him as he takes us through, uh, shows the examples, gives us exercises, uh, that you can actually actively part part participate in doing that sort of thing. But ultimately, as we do all of this work and as you think about the project that you want to do, first of all for your article, and then leading on into the product that you're going to create during the rest of term, and then produce your critical evaluation presentation for the last week of term, then these are some of the questions that you're going to need to think about very, very early on. And I come back to the sort of linking into sustainable information corporate governance as a module because we need to think, first of all, about our sources of data. We think of governance issues, we think about practicality as well. So the first question is very much around the basis, uh, the, around the sort of the type of sources. Is there a best source? Or do we just have a range of good sources? And we need to think about where they are, where we can get at them, how can we get at them. We need to think about this word veracity. Can we actually believe the data? Can we rely on the data? Because as uh, John Easton said, and you know, you've probably 
seen this already before now. Back in 2012, he produced a paper about the growth of the big data out there, the amount of data that's doubling every 18 months now. <clears throat> you remember Moore's law about hardware, silicon, that the capacity of a, uh, um, silicon chips doubled every 18 months. That is now applying to the growth of data. Data is doubling pretty much every 18 months to two, uh, two years worldwide. And unfortunately, about at least 80% of that data is of uncertain uh, veracity. We don't know which bits are true. We don't know which, which bits of data are wrong, nor do we know how much wrong most of that data is. And that's why <clears throat> last year, while I was doing that project with uh, some of your predecessors on location services on smart devices, because we all get a feel that when we use one of these things and take photos and get um, location tagging, and then look at where the phone thinks it is on a map, we notice that a lot of the places that we take photos aren't quite where we thought we or knew that we were standing. And so we were trying to do two things. One, to characterize how many of the locations were accurate, I, where I am, <clears throat> but also how much, when they weren't accurate, how much inaccurate they were. And that, so that was where we got the, <clears throat> the perspective. 85% of the data uh, that we collected was within plus or minus 25 meters, which for many purposes is not bad. The problem was with those other 15% which were from 25 meters error to 10, 20, 30 kilometers, and as I've said before, one at 1,600 kilometers error. But you can't necessarily work out which one is 100 meters error or 40, uh, 40 kilometers error, and that may have a problem. And the same goes with an enormous amount of the big data that's out there in other things, whether it's location or all the other sorts of things. If, for example, Twitter and tweets. And where people do a lot of work in a field called sentiment analysis. So they're doing text-based analysis of the words that are in the tweets. Um, during the 2012 Olympics, uh, a lot of people were doing a lot of work doing sentiment analysis on the tweets relating to the hashtags relating to activities going on during the, uh, the Olympics in London. And one of the problems there is that people use text or words in tweets quite differently to normal natural language. Um, one of the things that we cannot detect by machines very easily is irony. So you might say, that was a really great event, meaning absolutely rubbish. So you're using words with the exact opposite meaning that the dictionary normally gives them. Now, when you listen to people, it's easy. You can detect, we can detect, humans can detect irony pretty easily most of the time. Machines, machine language man, uh, analysis finds it incredibly difficult, particularly in the Twitter environment where your tweets are limited to what, 140, 160 characters? 140. And so we're, we're compressing it, we're not necessarily using the, the normal spelling for the, the words, and so on and so forth. It makes it really, really difficult to understand what's going on. And there's a lovely example in uh, SAS Analytics Europe last year in Frankfurt, a report, a presentation by someone from a bank in South Africa. And they just released a new product, and they were looking at t tweets and other things going on in the social uh, media sphere about their product, using the hashtag that they thought they'd got for uh, their product and the name of their product. Unfortunately for them, a little bit north of South Africa, I think it was, in I can't remember whether it was in Zimbabwe or Zambia, or may have just been in the northern part of South Africa, at exactly the same time, there was a great kerfuffle about, I think it was a hippopotamus, which happened to have the same name as their banking product. So in trying to, when they were scooping up all of this data, all these tweets and things coming out of social media, they had to then think, ah, is this a, 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 an item that refers to 
the rhinoceros or hippopotamus or whatever it was up north, or is that relating to our product of the same name here in sort of the Joburg, Pretoria, Cape Town sort of area? <coughs> and so there's all sorts of problems about understanding the truthfulness. We also need to worry about the fact that if we are doing sentiment analysis, for example, with tweets and so on, humans actually change quite rapidly with time, their perspective, their views, and so on. So it might be very, very positive about a product or a service one day. And if you pick that up in that sort of block of tweets, thinking, oh, we've got some good positive sentiment, and therefore we can do something based on that, we make a decision to do something, how long is the truthfulness of that set of tweets going to apply for? How soon will it be before the, the people who are doing that change their perspective, change their views, and start tweeting negatively or behaving the opposite of uh, what they're tweeting? So you've got the variability, but we're not very good at things like that. So we have to think about the best or just good or plain lousy sources of data. But that's another one. How many of you are drivers and therefore you look at on here for the maps to look at the amount of traffic that's being reported on the different roads that you want to go and you see a red load of red dots? That's crowdsourced data because there's a small number of people allow these sort of devices to report home to Google or to Apple or to Microsoft about where they are so they can improve their maps. That means they're actually doing traffic flow analysis. So first of all, what proportion of people driving along that stretch of the road actually contribute to the red or amber dots along a section of road? Secondly, how often and how quickly do they update it? Because I was standing outside a hotel where a conference was uh, just before Christmas last year, a conference that we, the university, had organized. And I was looking, again, because I'm interested in sort of seeing how accurate location services are and the sort of traffic flow warnings on, on the maps is kind of related to that. And I was standing there looking 150 yards that way and 150 yards that way, and there was not a piece of there was hardly a car or a bus or a taxi in sight. It was completely empty. And yet, on a piece of road that I was standing next to, on Apple Maps and Google Maps, red dots all the way along. Interesting. Not very accurate. So if I had carefully and deliberately driven around to avoid that nice little pass through uh, route, I could have actually ended up driving quite a few more miles through a different set of red lines which probably were blocked up, or maybe no red lines and blocked up. It's all a conspiracy by those diesel companies. No, I don't think it's got anything <laughs> to do with diesel at all. No, no, this is before that. Um, anyway, those are a, a different set of questions which we can talk about next Monday in, uh, under the sort of ethical side of uh, governance. The other sort of questions we ought to be thinking about, and this is not just here for our project, but once you get out of there into the big wide world that's trying to do some of these big projects, you need to think about where are you going to put your equipment, your IT, your computers and your networks and storage. Should it be on your own infrastructure, or should it be somewhere out there on one of these cloud-based facilities? Whose cloud-based facilities? I mean, for your project, you won't have any option, really, in terms of location, because it's going to be on the IBM network. But one of the things that's really, really important when you're playing with these huge amounts of data that stream in at enormous rates of knots on occasion, you have to think about how quickly it, and how easy is it to scale up and scale down. Now, there are times when you might have a workload which requires 100 processors worth of capacity. Or, and a little bit later, no data's there, and so you want to scale down very, very rapidly to one or two, just awake, just ready to keep going. And in terms of our own compute environment here at the university, you, know, you can think about the PeopleSoft software that you use for enrolling on. At least I think it's PeopleSoft, probably. Now, during the pre last two weeks, 
the university's got thousands and thousands and thousands of students all trying to enrol on the thing. So you want huge amounts of capacity so that enrolment works smoothly for you. But you won't need all of that capacity this week because there's nobody enrolling at all, probably maybe one or two. So you need to be able to scale up and scale down very fast. And something like AWS or EC3, uh, is it EC3 or two? EC2. EC2. Um, you, need, you may want to have you know, just a sort of one running permanently, and you want to pay for one running permanently that allows you, when you want to really do something really serious and huge amounts of data, suddenly say, I need a thousand of them, and I'll pay for a thousand for the next hour, and then scale back down to one. And so that, those are sort of questions that you might be thinking about there. And then there are lots and lots of other questions which you need to start thinking about. No. Part of this module is all about learning to find the right questions. And you've got background. You've been doing this what game for a couple of years with a year in um, placement and so on, or probably, or you've had several years of background in, in real world. So you can start thinking about what other questions there are. Now in the folder where you found this, you will find uh, three other sources, three other PDFs, which are PDFs from last year's uh, first three weeks of lectures, which cover uh, the, the really interesting questions about, or help you to understand the breadth of this topic. And then you'll get to go from there, once you understand that, to start thinking about the research you need to do later on today uh, in terms of what sort of problem are you wanting to address? What's the purpose behind it? Who's, gonna, who's it gonna benefit? You're gonna have to bring in Think about those data kind type projects that have been done in the past. On which note, by the way, I've contacted data kind in, in London and they are a bit busy at the moment, so they very regretfully apologise that they can't come and give you a talk on the sort of projects that they do. But at least you can see, you know that link, you can see the sort of projects that they've done, the types of things that they've done, which are of benefit to the world and to particular groups of people. And so and I would like you to think about those, maybe go and search for other types of projects like that. There are m many, many, many reports on the internet that you can find about these types of uh, activities, of crowdsourced data, um, of big data that can be used to gain insights. There's data out there about um, solar and wind generation, there's one out, a fantastic website out in Ontario State, which provides data on every single wind turbine farm, uh, water, hydroelectric schemes, solar, nuclear, coal, wood burning, everything. Um, and you can actually get, extract lots of data from there. You'll have to sign up. Uh, but it costs nothing, there's no consequences at all. They don't even email you, it's just access uh, credentials. And that gives you huge amounts of data. There's a similar one here in the, from the UK, which are little fans and our first set of uh, solar panels are connected to, and you can find out you know, how, how much electricity they generate each day or for hours. But that covers, all, this, that, that website actually runs out of, Ger from Germany I think it is, and covers the world, and you can get report data about generation. Some of them show the data on an hourly basis, some of them just on a daily basis. So there's huge amounts of different sources and different things you can do. So what I'd like you to do now is to go, first of all, start off with, um, with these three reports here. Uh, hang on. These three reports here, the, uh, last year's introduction, uh, then things about the hardware environment, grids and clouds and so on, and then the third one is sort of d data sources, like crowdsourcing, and a little perspective on the Internet of Things. So that's what I want you to do for the next so half hour, three quarters of an hour. And then we'll, um, when you've done that, made some progress on that, we'll uh, have a little discussion about what you found out, what, you, what this has led you to think about, and then in the workshop when we move up the corridor, uh, then we'll start thinking about how that helps you to form your ideas for the assignment for the, uh, the article. Okay?